You know, in any decisions that are made on any topic, you know, whether it be tolls, um, there's just so much misinformation. And, you know, we attended a, a meeting that, at the, you know, with, uh, I think, um, who was it, Summers put it on. And it wasn't a factual meeting at all. It was people had their agendas and they just came to the meeting with their agendas. It was not fact based at all. Nobody had read you know, the, the study that had been done, because if they had all of the concerns, there was approaches to remedy those concerns. You know, the oral school, the five um, corners, yeah. um, you know, big concern over traffic. There's not a traffic problem in coming out of DB. We're going to be hiring 3,000 more people. And at 2.30, there's barely, you know, a five-minute holdup there. Yeah. See, it, I wouldn't even dare drive into Mystic. Um, and, and it seems like people just come out with these sound bites of we need traffic studies and 20 new apartments is going to choke the Five Corners area. It's not keeping with the residential. It's not residential there. There's Charter Road, there's Dunkin' Donuts, there's Subway, there's Carnes, there's a little strip mall. I mean, it's not a residential. Yet people just seem to have the ability to object for the sake of objecting and the facts come out almost after it's too late. Um, so anyway, it's just something for that's a concern of mine. Do people do business cases and research up front before it goes for vote? And why are things discovered that apparently were so a bit, you know, the information was available so after we, the fact? I'm not going to comment on what the town council does or doesn't do because I don't sit there and I didn't have it. Neither of us have been on there for. Several years. Six years. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> but in the state, we when we get, we'll, we'll start soon, we'll talk to you how the state runs at right. the Capitol, which is different. But we have paid staff. Right. You can see some of them here that do a lot of work for us all year round. So they earn their money. So you want to start? Well, I, I think on the factual side, when, when I, what I see, especially the difference I got to see between the state and being on the council for the time I was, right. you know, as, a, as a complete volunteer, uh, we, we did as much due diligence as we could. We'd go to our, you know, once a, one, once a week meeting uh, in Hartford when they're looking to change a law. The difference is the amount of lobbyists from both sides. And people think of lobbyists as a bad, ugly, bad name. Uh, but I'll be honest, when I, and that's kind of what I thought when I first got up there. But a lot of it is, is credibility. And that's what comes first with lobbyists. Because if they come in and, and tell me a lie, you and this is not what I expected, but if you came in because you were pushing... Whatever it was, tolls or against tolls, whatever you were saying, and you said, "Joe, it's this, this, and that," and that's why you can't do it. And then uh, the lovely lady next to you walks in and says, "Did he tell you this? Because that is an absolute lie." You're and right. and if I find out that she was absolutely correct and you were misleading me, you're gonna have an awful tough time convincing anybody of anything ever, ever again. Okay. People have long memories up there, and and I think you know that system that when people see a something going through without a public meeting at the state level, that's when they get very, very concerned. Because they're saying, how are you pushing us through? How's that working? Sometimes there's some emergency things that, that have to happen. And so you've seen it with executive orders when we were in a 100-year pandemic. Uh, but I, I do like that when the public does get to be involved. Because if it can get fleshed out before and all those questions get asked before and then answered, I mean, we're all better for it, and I agree. Mm -hmm. And like this document that we have here was put together by the nonpartisan Office of Legislative Research. Those folks are there for every rep and senator and their staff to research any issue. They work all year round. So we do we have access to a lot of tools in the state? Any issue we can have research. Any we have interns. We have full staff that's assigned to us individually as a group, and we have interns. And we have nonpartisan that you would send out more detailed things or things that you. You know, you want to make sure, double check. Yeah. We that, email them all the time. They're great. They're good workers. The one building you're talking about, the five corners, too, and my, and that was actually voted. And, and I know we're talking local stuff, but that that didn't pass the zoning. 
Right. So that ended up being something that was in the council. For me, if I was on it, probably, I, but again, not being on the zoning board and not right. listening to all the the facts. And the, that's the greatest thing about being a counselor later on because I, I'd be in the same way. I said, why are people saying this? Why do you vote that way? Uh, or why would they ever do this? And if I was on the council, I was with two gentlemen one time that took it upon themselves to have, because there was a pump that was bad, 100 feet down in the ground, and it was the best offer they got. The highest was $6 million. Someone said five, and they took a, a quote for $5.2 million to change the pump. And nine people on the council said, wow. And I'm a construction worker. And I said, boy, does that sound expensive for a pump. But if they went and got three quotes, I'm not sure. I don't know their work. So these two counselors asked me, because I'm a construction worker, if I'd also join them in climbing down on a Saturday afternoon uh, to 150 feet to see this pump. I didn't need to see it. You know, I think the professionals brought the people. But they went and did it. And for us, we put that on. We decided, they came back and said, you need to change it, and it's a lot of stuff that has to happen. They understood it. Uh, they did the due diligence. We put it up for a vote. It went out to our community, and it ended up winning. I think, you know, vastly what most people voted, but it was 2,200 people voted for it, and 1,100 people walked in the booth that day and said, I don't you know what, the toilet flushes. a $4 million pump just seems too expensive to me. But there were people that put in hundreds of hours of research, multiple companies bid on it. Uh, I was part of the group that approved it to put it up there. And I can see, if you're not involved, to, to, to question things, but you got to believe when, when something gets that far and it's put on the ballot, Someone did some kind of research that, that at least your people that you trust, someone that you elected, or maybe you didn't vote for one person on the council, but you have to have some kind of human faith that, that they're not just spending $4.2 million on a pump because they like spending money on pumps. And, and that, that was one of my biggest takes for my council experience anyway. And to, to be able to go through that and have all those meetings and understand that not every decision is made uh, in a vacuum. Most aren't. Oh, well, no, I was going to say, when we were talking about the issue before, and it sounded like um, maybe some folks weren't informed about it, because honestly, the lack of local news is, is a real problem when it comes to learning about the kinds of issues that you folks are talking about. And I mean, it's just that simple, and I have no idea what to do about it. But If you're looking for state local news, like Connecticut State, you did, if you do cga.ct.gov, if there's any, it, that's how I find out my schedule a lot of times. You can put it up and they'll have every single meeting because it's public knowledge. So if I know I'm, I'm giving you a little inside, inside help if you get there, you, you, you basically are looking at the schedule that all of us would have. And if there's a meeting that you're interested in, a public meeting or something you want to follow, you can just see that and then go to CTN and actually watch part of the meeting. Uh, you can, if, if you don't have time to watch a meeting and it was a bill that you missed, you can click on another button and read all the testimony. And, and, and the, those are real facts. When everyone says, God, how, I didn't know the facts. The one thing I can guarantee you, if there's, a, if there's a bill on education and Anthony was in that 12-hour meeting and person after person came up and he was watching it, uh, that, those are facts. And, and maybe some people come up and say the wrong thing, but again, if they're lobbyists in a way, the person behind them will say, you know, I don't want to correct somebody. <laughs> But somebody spoke earlier, and they said this, and that's wrong. So that's how we come up with those decisions on and how we vote on bills. So, so the one thing you can count on is legislators do. We get inundated with with facts, and not always perfect or good facts. Good right. facts. But but we we have we get to they they some are competing facts, but but usually uh, it's that pile of information that we can take, disseminate, and then make a vote. And if you really are interested, because you're not going to be in. I'm not interested in every bill. There's, what was the final bill number? 5,000 and something? In a, in a three-month session? So, again, we're responsible. And, and if you're a Republican or a Democrat, somebody's going to put out a bill that's in your party that's super controversial, and there's 5,000 bills out there, and you'll have someone walk up in the street and say, well, what about that bill? Don't you see? They, they hate us. They want to take this away or that away. And I said, well, I don't even know about that bill. And a lot of times, because it never came out of committee, and never saw anything, but once a, once a legislator files a bill, the, the news goes out and looks in for anything that's like a lightning rod bill. Yeah. So where they can get people excited about it, and because that sells, and it's news, and that's what they want to talk about. But the reality is, uh, most of those bills will never see the light of day. They never come out of committee. 
Yeah, so we have about four out of the four or five thousand bills that were introduced in that public hearings. And just for folks who might want a little procedural background, because I do love procedure. She loves procedure. I love it. <laughs> uh, so we do, on most of our bills, we started in February this year. This was a short session, because it's an even year, 2022, ends with an even number. Odd years, we start in January. So we start with public hearings, right? Bills get drafted, public hearings right in the beginning of session. Committees vote this year. Most of the bills were voted out in March. A few stragglers in April. Some extra things coming out one at a time as one-offs now. Uh, but most of the bills were voted out in March and the first week of April. So we had from all the public hearings, all that's there in the computer system, cga.ct.gov. And if you miss something, all the public hearings, doesn't matter if they were two hours or 24 hours, they're on YouTube. And you can watch them too. Every bit of it. Fast forward through some of it or watch the whole thing. And rewind and catch things sound bites that you wanted to hear a second time, all on YouTube. Then uh, bills, if it's a Senate bill, it goes to the Senate first. If it's a House bill, it goes to the House first, and then switches up. Uh, again, they get transmitted back and forth. And I was just texting someone on a bill we're working through on Wednesday, trying to get an amendment filed in the computer system to get it up for Wednesday. So we never actually stop. We're trying to get all of our bills through. Um, but, and, we, and we also have this bill analysis, which is my favorite part. <laughs> if folks maybe didn't want to watch a 24-hour public <laughs> meeting or didn't have the time for that, if you go on cga.ct.gov, you can look through your bills, advanced bill search. You can keyword it. If Let's say you're interested in veterans or you're interested in, you can keyword search Groton. You can keyword search in London. You can keyword search early childhood. And the bills that are pertinent to that subject come up. Then when you click on the bill, you click on bill analysis, and our great, um, our great team has done a summary of the bill, broken the legal language into common, regular English, done a summary, or sort of, it's pretty good, done a summary of who supports the bill, a summary of who opposes the bill, and gives you what happened in committee. So if it was unanimous, or if it was you know not unanimous, it's all right there. And then they do a summary of the fiscal note, or how much it's going to cost the state. The bill analysis is really a key. For a lot of things, if you didn't sit on that committee, that you can, if something, something's coming up quick for vote, and you, you only have a couple minutes to read it, the bill analysis is, is your good friend for quick reading. It's like your um, crib notes yeah. from back we, when we were there in is, school. There is so, we're inundated with so much information that, that that analysis really helps. I mean, besides Ed Murray and Emily and, and Cody. Um, I mean, the, that is the quickest way for us to understand some of the bills that we get. Um, I see in that analysis that they put in. Yes, yeah, so I, I want to um, I want to bring up an unpopular topic, and I wanted it's kind of two part question. I want to know where we are with the tolls, and I also well not a question, but I want to make a statement right up front. I'm in favor of tolls, and the reason I'm in favor of tolls is one. I read the report. My husband and I actually read the $10 million report that we paid for. We did a lot of reading. <laughs> well, we, we read through, yeah, we read the report, and we realized that, first of all, like we talked about the sound bites, you wanna, one of the things that was said is, do you want to drive through 86 stanchions every day? Well, that's stupid. <laughs> One, that would mean you have to crisscross the state every Correct. single day. Second, per the report, it wasn't decided where, it stand, where how many there were going to be, where they were going to be. The big reason that I'm in, I'm in favor of this, we wa I watch those cars, and it is true. Clearly, 40% of those cars driving over the bridge are from out of state. And I would like the people who are driving through our state to help pay for our roads. Um, the, I know last year, uh, Governor Lamont said that he's really going to work on 95 down near Stanford, Beerfeld, the nightmare area. But this is becoming a real nightmare. Hey, you, you go from Groton to New Haven, uh, Friday night or at 5 o'clock any night and God forbid it's the summertime it's a parking lot so we have two lanes down here so I'd like to see something done about this because and I see that on here it talks about traffic the traffic in this area is getting really unmanageable 
And I'd like to know if there's any kind of plan to address that. And I think that's where tolls would also help detect this traffic. There's a machine against tolls in Connecticut. It's built in and baked in. Uh, I was a big, humongous toll guy, and they, you know, but and I still am. I, I, I think one day they'll be there probably uh, because they'll have to be. Uh, but but the way to fix it, in my my estimation, uh, is we have some parts of our highway down here that are absolutely inexcusable to be to be the shape that they are. Uh, where, where East Lime is, where 395 and 95 meet, we've had deaths there, but, and then not just that, then New London, and then right here in Stonington and Groton. We have these three areas that the state knows for an absolute fact mm -hmm. that there's a, a high rate of incidents there. We know this. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the answer is, well, we don't have the money, because the money in East Lime would fix, instead of having a left-hand exit, because people's brains don't operate that way, mm -hmm. even though the sign tells them miles ahead, uh, they should take a right exit, do a over over the top and down, and that's something like three hundred or four hundred million dollars. They look at it. Uh, to me, the way we punish the state if we're from the side, just go back to them and, and take all of our data from our fire departments and police departments, uh, because I know we pay six million dollars for for the Quantum Bridge Fire Department up here. If they're going to be on a highway, they should absolutely be one thousand percent compensated, especially if they go into an accident that's happening in the same spot. If you are a homeowner and more people keep tripping over your sidewalk, it's the same thing that you didn't fix. Eventually, your insurance company is going to call you and say, you better fix that sidewalk or we're not covering you anymore. And it's almost a reverse, because that incentivize with the tolls. I'm absolutely, I'm, I was so convinced that they were going to go on, but there's an absolute machine. And they're fighting their own selves. These are trucking companies that are operating, owned and operated in Connecticut. And they're watching all these out-of-state truckers just use the roads they're paying for. Uh, and I, I don't understand it. It seems commonsensical, uh, but it seems like a dead issue to me for now. Uh, but I think future legislation is going to have to deal with it because electric cars don't buy gasoline, come to find out. And that's the only way we fund our roads now. So there's apps, unless they come out with a way to, to... Somebody said, well, we can keep track of cars and where they drive in America. Good luck with that one. We're gonna we're gonna have people sign up for that. For um, no, you're not. But but the toll thing, I'm a hundred percent. I don't know. I I don't. It's a mountain. Even, I was, even the truck, just the truck tolls, is not um, going to happen. That the, the there biggest, were no public hearings or raised bills on tolls this yeah. year. So in the next two weeks and two days, there will be no toll. There's no toll yeah. bill to go. Yeah. So for this year, no, there will not be a toll bill. <coughs> it would. I think that would be. Quite an issue to bring up without a public hearing. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, in the last two weeks and two days of session, so I would. I, well, I'm, I don't bet a lot. I'm going to bet that's not going to come. I think a lot's going to depend on this next election, who's governor. Um, depending on who's governor, you're either going to probably have tolls brought up again or tolls not brought up again. My advice to Lamont would be if he brings up tolls again, come out with a concrete plan and stick with it. I think he lost a lot of support. Um, he said he ran, he said he'd do truck tolls, and people like, I could, I said, I could do truck tolls. Mm -hmm. And then the plan changed, and the plan changed, and the plan changed, and every time it changed, I think he lost, um... Plus oh, he just refused to do it. Lost yeah. some support, <laughs> um, you know, and I think that people got confused, and that allowed the whole, you know, it's 150, no, it's 80, no, it's 5, and I don't think the general public of Connecticut really... New and then the governor did lose support from the public on the bill. And then there was a huge misinformation. Huge, yeah. very expensive. They invested in misinformation. Yeah. 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 So I think that would be my we advice. That meeting. <laughs> yeah. so, so, so this is on traffic safety is on the agenda, and this is just we we were wondering ourselves all time high in deaths and number of citations for traffic violations is in half. That just is, is incredible. Now, I need to get educated here too. There's a state, there's a local, get it. So if this gets passed, does it get executed by local police departments or is this the state police as far as the you know the speeding and other traffic laws, increased fines, etc.? So the traffic safety bill that came out of transportation, because I said in transportation, has to do in Connecticut, there there are allowed to be cameras, just to be clear. Our town, both the ta all towns that we currently represent, except Ledger, I don't think has a lot of cameras. So we'll say Groton, New London, Stonington, has cameras that they use 
regularly on busy intersections where they can monitor traffic. Right. It is against the state law right now to have cameras that do red light tickets like how they do in Providence. It's not state law, it's not allowed, so no municipality can do it. Okay. This was a discussion on whether or not we wanted to have cameras uh, tickets, which is not did not make it through the committee bill, so it will not be the law. Um, there is a lot of discussion, which may or may make it still in debate right now. We only have two two and a half weeks left about um, cameras on work sites. So if someone is speeding through a work site, again, you should not be speeding through a work site. You should you should slow down. Um, if you can go to the right and make sure the workers have ample space so they don't get hit and killed, you should be able to do that. That's what the bill was discussion on, should we have cameras? Well, some people are for it, some people are very much against it. Again, I don't know if it will make it law in two weeks and two days. We'll see. Uh, we're coming out of a pandemic, so a lot of, even the juvenile crime that we've, we've heard on the news every single night, I think it's related to, to this pandemic too. People, people weren't out and about, they weren't driving. I mean, everything's an issue. Like we, we had a, two million people from the workforce disappear. The, the government is scrambling, trying to understand where everybody is and what changed. And what changed is, you know, the pandemic happened, I think, and people got back in their cars and they were not used to driving, and, and maybe they're not, not as wary about cops anymore. Because a lot, a lot, because of COVID, even police are saying, we're not going to pull people over, have this interaction if we don't have to. If they're going 15 miles over, maybe, maybe that's okay. Maybe, so a lot of this, I think people just, you know, it's, it's that right. you had a little bit of freedom, of driving around, and I, I think you're going to see a big turn on that because those are numbers that none of us can live with, correct. And, and they're correctable because you know I think mm -hmm. immediately if you start getting tickets because you've been driving through zones or, or you know doing those types of behaviors, uh, you do slow down, uh, and it's and, and technology, and we have a whole new group of kids and young adults that have their licenses that know nothing other than being on their phones 24/7. I think. Uh, that's a. I think it's distracted driving. That's it's a it's bigger problem than drunken driving. Uh, COVID, COVID, trans, COVID transformed everything into something that we never understood, and now we're, we're reaping. Uh, we're reaping what what happened, or uh, what went on during COVID. You know, whether it's motor vehicle, whether it's education, whether it's um, health. Um, we we are reaping what we never prepared ourselves to do. Um, so, especially when it comes to traffic, you know, uh, and, and, and people being off the road for so much time um, and then coming back on the road and not really being accustomed to what it's like being off the road for so long. You know, and people, it's just people, they, everybody's, people forget. Everybody's frightened people forget, and angry. Yeah, and, yeah. And so, so traffic delay, mm -hmm. people get angry. So now here's the hostility. Now here comes the police. Now there goes your ticket. And, and it's going to there's more traffic. It's more traffic. Over. Well, and now yeah, and that's there's gonna, more traffic. And it's going to increase. Yep. Yep. It's going to so, increase because now everybody's coming out of the box. Yeah. And everybody's going everywhere to yep. get away from where they are. Mm -hmm. And now those are the. This is what's going to happen. And um, what people have to remember, both our community members and our police, you have to remember to be friendly. Don't let your friendliness take away from people being able to communicate and help each other because we're still in crisis. This is a crisis mode that we're still in. We're trying to come out of it. And coming out of it, people are impatient, both sides. We do have some good traffic in the work spills. Um, again, there are some hopefully help for traffic that made it through, but this doc was produced in January with the thoughts of what could we do, and some of that stuff just didn't make it in the Bill of Transportation. There is a lot that they're doing for studies, funding, trying to find those traffic choke zones and trying to make improvements. Government does move slow, but studies on improvements, if it happens a year from now, it still means that people get relief from traffic. Um, we all worked on a bill last year, which hopefully will help, which is more access to public transportation, trains and buses in eastern Connecticut. And there's some, we're trying to get some money um, to allow the bus company, so we have seat bus here in southeastern Connecticut, to allow more access to buses, because if we could get more people on the buses out of their cars, it would help the traffic immensely. Yeah. Um, if you look at seat, you can't get from EB New London to EB Groton. Yeah. So you've got all these workers who don't have a way to get to their workplace, and yeah. they have set shifts. That would take so many cars off so the road. So many cars off the road. Yeah. Just from here to yeah. there. I would, I would you know, use it. It's I would sense. use it if it was more convenient. And not, that's just it, being able to access the mm -hmm. first and we, the are, first bus. we are in contact yep. with the commissioner. Um, 
to try and make that happen. There's a lot of avenues that we're trying. Yeah. Between here and EP, between here and Juvenile Court, um, you know, between here and Hartford. Um, we can make a bus. There's no bus. access, and, and we're trying to work on a, a, a plan so that we can get a bus from New London and Groton to Hartford, you know, using the back road, going through Salem. I mean, it's just common sense that it would stop so much traffic. Yeah. If you think of how many folks work in the outskirts of Norwich and Colchester and come down to EB New London or EB Groton, if those first folks weren't on the road, if the folks in the old line, east line, weren't on the road to come and worried about making that left or right to get to EB, the amount of traffic we'd have produced on the bridge would be immense. Well, we, had a, we had a constituent bill that it was always been my dream, but it was his reality. He brought the bill uh, to us and it was basically having the, the train tracks that run north and south on, on both sides of the river, the east and west side of the river, just go up and connect the London and Norwich and go back and forth all day. That would be such a, I mean, connecting electric mole, the sub base, the United States Coast Guard, thermos containers, downtown Norwich, downtown New London, uh, the tracks are there. They're not owned by, they're owned by Providence and Worcester. Uh, and they, you know, the, the, the obvious thing is, oh, you know, you can never go on the sub base. The train can never go. It's funny. So I've worked on the sub base and it's full of people on trains because they run one from Providence to Worcester. It doesn't run all the time, uh, but it does go right through the base. Uh, they don't get to stop on the don't base. Stop yeah, you can't stop. No but, you get, but you get to see some submarines on your way up. Uh, but that, that's the kind of thinking that we have to do. And if you're going to do public transportation, in my mind, it has to be so consistent. It can't be we're doing 7.30 today and then on Saturdays it's 8.30. And then because people need absolute consistency mm -hmm. and positivity. That they walk to that bus stop yeah. to get to work, that it's going to be there. And that's what you lack if you don't have the proper funding. Yeah, so that study bill is in the study right now. It's going to come out next year, and hopefully for next session we'll, be, we'll see what the funding is. Hopefully folks will support us on getting that funding out of the budget to improve our infrastructure here in southeastern Connecticut. Especially with your train bill. Yeah, it's yeah. a good bill. David. Yes, Chris, hi. I'm here tonight on my favorite subject. Uh, the new the, the new Connecticut homestead exemption law, and in light of uh, Judge Tancredi's decision, um, what do you see the legislature doing regarding so, the homestead exemption? Yeah. So for folks who fifty thousand dollars, which is more in line with a starter house or a average small house to try to protect people's homes from being taken advantage of uh, by creditors. That bill had a start date of October 2021 because we passed it in um, June of 2021, so we had to start it after the bill passed. And the discussion of Dave and other attorneys like him who do bankruptcy was, is it retroactive or not? And we put a bill in this year to talk about how we're going to clarify it. But in the meantime, the courts have been deciding. And there was just a really great opinion that came out Friday afternoon. Yes. Friday afternoon, which said that the bill is retroactive. One judge said that. So the legislature has a bill pending. We could do a couple of things, and I don't know what the end result is in the next two, two weeks, two days, but I can tell you the options. The options are we could let the courts, and again, one judge has done one thing, which is great. Another judge may do a separate thing, and it may go up to circuit court. Hopefully it doesn't have to go up to the United States Supreme Court, because bankruptcy is all federal for folks. Um, so the committee could do nothing with the bill that they that passed out of committee, or the committee could choose to make it clearly retroactive, which would be beneficial to people like Dave Falvey and bankruptcy attorneys. People in the banking world might not appreciate that, so there's pro and con. Or the committee could make it clear that it's not retroactive, which would really screw up the court decision, so I don't think we're going to do that. Um, we could either, I think it's more likely that it will either be the committee lets the courts, things go through courts, reevaluates in January when we're back in, or the committee could um, make it clear and follow what that judge did. But I honestly do not know what the answer is. We'll find out together. As soon as I know, I will tell you, though. Thank you. So when it comes up for a vote, I'll ask Chris. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. <Jeff. laughs> but when do you think we'll know what in the legislative calendar and so forth? And it's up at a so many year. I mean, that year, bill so is a marked bill, so it would actually it's a House bill, so it would it would either be called for vote with an amendment, mm -hmm. and then you would know that it's on the calendar. Ladies and smart. gentlemen, we're calling House calendar blank. That's the notice we'd get yeah. um, with the amendment. So any time, I, I know the schedule for this week. It's not this week. I can guarantee that part. Well, let's say how about this year. Or? I don't know, Dave. I really don't. Okay. But I, I don't think it's coming up this week. 
Um, but it could come up any any moment between now and the fourth at midnight. That's like kind of the fun, exciting part for attorneys and those of us who really get excited about the law. Like, is this bill or anyone working on a bill? Is it going to pass? Is it going to be called? Um, we don't know. Now that we're talking, you, know, you don't want your bill to be talked about at twelve oh five a.m. I know. But, but I know. now that we're talking about it, guess what time is going to come? <laughs> can, I, can I ask Chris what's your position on it? I. I am happy either way if we let the courts go or if we clarify the retroactive to retroactivity. I am not pushing either way. Um, however, the bill comes out, I I think it's you know if the bill comes out for retroactivity, I think it's really great for creditors, and I support the bill. If the Speaker of the House says I'm going to wait and see how the courts decide, I'm not going to say no, you're wrong to wait and see how the courts decide. I'll, either way, it's a good bill. either way. We've got a good bill, we've got a good court opinion, um, and we'll see what happens. Yes, I see, I see of course, um, meanwhile, uh, Connecticut, uh, on this, actually a little law that's very important to um, people keeping their homes uh, and not losing them, that's why it's enacted. And um, I think it should be mentioned that uh, Rhode Island has a $500,000 homestead exemption. Mass Massachusetts, the same, 500 in New York. Depending on what county, it's a 500,000 exemption. And that's for two, and Connecticut one, as we know. But the big thing is that uh, the havoc is going to wreak with uh, the average person um, who doesn't realize that if they ever have a problem uh, financially, and they want to keep their home, that uh, right now uh, no one knows what's going to happen. And so it's like the curse of the Chinese. May you be born during interesting times. It's certainly interesting because no one knows what's going to happen. And um, the creditors, uh, for the most part, I haven't heard any complaint from them, but of course uh, uh, maybe some of the lobbyists from Coke would be up there um, uh, vehemently against it. And I'd just like to also ask one question too, because uh, it's never in the papers, I always keep looking. Are there any Tea Party members in the uh, Connecticut legislature? I think Tea Party is an old term. I think it's yeah. they have a conservative caucus. Conservative caucus, I think, is what they're calling it. But there certainly are, you know, and uh, and they're, they're they're pretty active. Um, and, and you know, we get to, that's why I tell people when you talk about being interested in politics or, or figuring out bills, I, I encourage everybody to watch it, um, and because you get to know the people that are representing you. There, there's some things that are said on that House floor that I 1,000% am appalled to hear, and I cannot, it, my stomach turns, and you know what's funny is because uh, when I first got up there, I said, I'm gonna talk all the time. I talk all the time. They, they have to shut me up half the time. I like, I enjoy talking. And, you, and But in, in the reality of legislation, you start killing other people's bills when you go up and talk. When we're talking about 12 o'clock midnight, and that bill means a lot to you, the one we just talked about, I could go out and just talk for 10 hours about some labor bill that means everything to me. And as I'm talking, i saying, Dave, well, while Joe keeps running his mouth, your bill's dying and your bill's dying. And that's not the way that I thought it was. But I guess that's the only way you could get things done when you have 156 people with this many different opinions. But you have to eat a lot of humble pie up there. You have to understand mm -hmm. that you can't say everything. But when you're on, a, on say, like a conservative caucus, you can get up and speak for as long as you want because your bills, and again, this is probably going to sound divisive, but um, you can kill all those bills because you're probably not happy if any of them pass anyway. Uh, but it becomes this game, and, uh, and it's hard because there's a lot of people that get hurt when these good bills don't go through, and it's a shame. Uh, but, but absolutely, we, you know, that's why there's other levers that we can use with the conservative car because everybody needs stuff for their towns. And we work with them on that because nobody comes up saying they want to cut their own school funding. They want to cut your school funding because you get too much and you get too much and we don't need that. But our, our town happens to be very good with our money. Uh, so there are levers. 
Uh, but yeah, it's definitely there. Uh, but you know, they would say the same thing about us probably if they're in a legislative meeting. <laughs> you know? yeah. That's why, it's, like Joe said, it's real important for people to watch. As much as people say, "Oh, I hate politics," it's really important for you to watch politics, especially those that are representing certain areas, because you'll get a full understanding of how that person thinks or what that person thinks. And then once you're on that house floor, you'll be surprised. You'll be so surprised with some of the spew that comes out of something. So someone said last year. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which time? But let me hear it. I got two. Which you might think, depend, everyone I think will agree that these were not things that should have said on the House floor. And they were said to get a raise out of people on the other side, out of Democrats and more moderate Republicans. Because if they got a raise, if these conservative caucus members got a raise out of us, and we all raised our hand or pushed our button to speak, and each of us spoke unlimited, we would have talked on each of those very good bills for hours and hours and hours as to how wrong this other person was. One issue was we were talking about sexual assault on campuses, and a member of the House, yeah, see, because you saw it too, of the Conservative Caucus said, well, you only get raped if you're drinking or wearing suggestive clothing. That's it. There's only two cases of rape. Of rape on college campuses. And we had to, yeah, that's how we all felt. That's how we, all felt. <laughs> we had to try to keep ourselves calm and not let that attempt to get a razz out of us work. And it's so hard. Oh, it's so hard. Because I mean, we're still mad. It is so we're hard. We're all still mad. Because people just run. I, I don't run. sit in the chamber. Because if, I, if you do, the bond's too close. Too close. you got to say that, Joe. No. Another issue, someone said there's no such thing as racism. <laughs> and no one, no one has been affected by racism since, uh, you know, the 1950s in our state. Well, that was a bill I remember. That got a little rise out of that people did, right? who said, like, <laughs> no, that's silly. But so while one or one person spoke and set the record straight, everyone else had to, like, kind of sit on our hands because we didn't want good bills. We didn't want good things for our communities to be taken away by having a big fight on the House floor. And I recall we saw once where there have been fights on the House floor. Yes. Uh, some people getting, some people say how they feel when someone says something that stupid. Um, and some people take it in the hallway, and some of us try our best to keep, you know, our good manners um, and practice our patience, right? It is, it is so difficult when you know that someone says something that is inappropriate and you can't say anything. Because if you say something, it's going to kill a bill. Because saying something about racism and, and only allowing one person to talk and then you, you get to talk to that person before they talk, but they don't say what you want them to say. So you, you're like, now you're even more mad, so you're going up to me, you're pressing your button more than your button can handle sometimes. And the speaker said someone like, like me to say, Anthony, mm -hmm. yeah. can't we take a walk outside about yeah. this? And I don't want to do it, and Anthony doesn't want to do it, yeah. but we want to make sure that we do right by everyone's community. Mm -hmm. And people think that we don't want to speak, and that's well, not the truth. Speak. That There's a lot of things that we want to speak on. But sometimes speaking too much can hurt you, and it hurts somebody else's bill. And you really got to try and refrain yourself because that is the object of some people right. to make you want to talk you, yeah. and make you keep talking so that the bills get yeah. pushed off. And we might have like some really good reasons to end on a certain day. Like we might have that someone's parent passed away and they want to make it to their parents' wake, yeah. and we're trying to get them out to make it to their parents' That's wake. That's happened a couple times. That's happened a couple times. Or we might have that someone's kid is having a high school graduation that starts at 7 p.m. And we really want to make the day move to and let them... keep that on the quiet because other people will do it. To let them be at their family event. Um, you know, we had a member get married and had to ask if they were going to move their wedding uh, to come because we had to come in special sessions. Be like, can you move your wedding? Can you move your... You know, you might have someone who's picking someone up. You know, your mom's coming in and, you know, really wanted to be able to spend time because your mom... Or dad is coming in for two days and it happens to be Daisy yeah, session. Yeah. So we try to be you gonna tell me someone had their baby on the floor. <laughs> Somebody probably would. <laughs> but someone did pass a kidney stone hey, on the floor. Oh. Oh. <laughs> did not get leave um, when they had a kidney stone a couple years ago uh, because their vote was so necessary, so I had to pass a kidney stone in the men's room. Oh, yeah. I, I spoke I was on the floor when they were speaking about insurance and health insurance. Mm -hmm. And I actually because of the work I do with Community Speaks Out. Um, we talk to parents all the time, and it's like the most disgusting question you could ever ask a human being uh, of their son or daughter 
when you when they think that they're dying and they're calling you for the first time and where their connection, mm -hmm. and my first question is, do you have insurance? Do you have health insurance? Because it makes a humongous difference on the care that person's going to get. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I've had I, one of my son. I'm union. My son was was had addiction issues. I, I parked two rows down and went down the street. Was in my truck crying, calling my union, and they're like, Joe, we have somebody. Don't worry, we have a guy. This it's exactly this person. We have an issue here. I got on the phone with this with this woman, and she just told me, just relax, take a breath. We have a plan. You can go to Marworth. We sent him to this beautiful place. I that night, I I called my friend whose son was going through the same thing. Lives in my neighborhood. My son and his son have been best friends since they were little, played on the same baseball team. And he actually called me and said he's concerned about his son. I said, well, just bring him to this place. I just brought Joey. I, it cost me 500 bucks. And then he called for his son. And his son was told that it was going to be, he was told it would be $30,000. Mm -hmm. And I saw, I never felt rich before, but I certainly have been insurance rich. I felt like a millionaire. And it didn't make me feel good. Because for me to have to tell my friend that, and then that next week I was talking about that insurance bill. And how important Kevin Lumbo's bill could mean for us to, to for him to be able to negotiate good insurance for everybody and, and how I thought it was a human right and why I think that. Three people got up after me from the conservative caucus and said, well, I don't believe insurance is a human right. And those are the things that people need to listen to. Because if they think like that, that's the person that is your voice, and your mouth. They're speaking for you. If, if, if you live here and you're in my district, and you are, I am absolutely speaking for you if I tell you that insurance is not a human right uh, after hearing, and this, this person worked at the hospital. His insurance just didn't cover addiction. That was his only crime. And then, so when I hear people say something like that, I get mad. And I, and I usually scream and yell, and so I have a good, a good solve for that. I sit in my office because we can vote from there now. And I, I, I turn the volume down, and I fill their, the people that normally say really random bad things, I fill it with good things <laughs> about insurance, right? Insurance being a human right and about, you know, funding programs that need to be funded. Uh, because, but it, in all seriousness, so I just ask people, find out who your rep is, watch some video on them, and see what they're saying. Because you don't need to ask them, you don't need to come to something like this, because we can say everything we want to make us sound good. Because what we say on the floor and how we vote is who we are. Yeah. Yeah, and care about bills that, that went through. If you care about insurance access, see who voted yes or no. It's it. Simple. It's, if no, you care good. about something in the budget that funded your town, see who voted yes or no. Correct. The vote's a record. That's how you voted. That's the best way to see the true colors of somebody. How, how nice somebody is. How, yeah. how they vote. <laughs> and, and you'll see that in a lot of people for when it comes to those um, who are less fortunate than many of us. It's it's It's... I, I can't even understand why people would vote against things to help people that don't have. Yeah. It's, it's, I, I just, ask myself you know, that every day. You know, <laughs> it's too expensive. Yeah. Okay, so oh. there was one thing I well, first of all, I'm going to miss you. I haven't lived in Groton very long, but you're my representative, and I have voted for you for two, two such two years or whatever. You so. only had three opportunities, so yeah. I appreciate it. So, so, but I have. Yeah, well, and I mean, last time you weren't opposed, so it was, you know, pretty easy to go in and vote for you. But I am, I'm going to miss you, and, and I'm sorry that, I hope you all get raises, so you can do this. I'm, I'm rooting for them. Oh, me too, me too. I mean, the feds don't have any problem giving themselves raises. They so. haven't had a raise in a very long time, too. You asked Joe. Oh, really? Morning. Yeah? Okay. It's well, been a long then, time. Okay. Um, but why I came is I'm a, a medical patient in the cannabis program, yeah. and there's been some changes to the regulations in our medicine, and it's going through, well, the Attorney General's office just put it through to the legislative um, committee, and they're going to review it. And I am concerned about these changes because the quality... The quality of some of the products has been declining. I've been in the program for four years, so I have some experience. Um, and these changes are going to, some of them are good, because it's going to make the, um, the regulations uniform. They go to two different labs. I don't want to get into it too much, because honestly, a lot of people don't care about it, and I understand that. But So that part of it, making it uniform is good. But... Um, they want to be able to remediate for mold. 
That means if they detect mold in it, they want to be able to treat it more. And from what I understand about remediation is that it really does degrade the therapeutic value of the medicine. So in doing this, trying to make it quote unquote safer for us, it's making it less effective for us. Um, I know none of you folks are on the committee that it's going to right now, but if these things come up later, um, I only speak for myself, but as a medical patient, I want to know that my medicine is safe. If I go to Walgreens, I want to know my medicine is safe. And I, if I go to a dispensary here in Connecticut, I want to know that my medicine is safe. And mold on medicine isn't safe. I, if it's a little or a lot, it's not. So thank you for letting me talk about it. Thank you very can, much. Can you send an email in regards to that to us? Oh, absolutely. And I have sent because emails, um, not to you folks, because again, none of you are on the committees that are dealing with it right now. Um, but I have sent them to, um, well, I send it to a Department of Consumer Protection because they're the ones who run the program often. I've also sent it to the governor's office. And I will be happy to send it yeah, to you folks it just to for information. I did sure. see something, I think there was a news article that I read about the mold in. Um, yeah. In, in medical marijuana, yeah. and I was surprised that you could have, because you shouldn't be smoking mold, like that's bad for your lungs. We're, and and the and thing about it is it's not only if you smoke it, I mean I use mostly it, edibles and things like that. It, yeah. Right, and once it's in the flower, it's in the flower, and all the product comes from those flowers, so yeah. 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 I, I did see it. I, I know it'll be in regs review, which we don't sit on, but if something passes through regs review, I that's... Oh, yeah, he does. If All something right. passes, oh, you do? Yeah, it's here, Regs Review. So oh, if something okay. passes through Regs okay. Review that Anthony can there's flag, your there's your guy. Yeah. Or okay. we can always change it in a future law if a department does something that we feel um, is a little too far in the law. So it's good to know that things are on the horizon, and it's good to have someone we can contact if we have questions who's knowledgeable about it. Okay. That's yeah, a, I will. I'll, I'll send some. That's a new committee for me this year. Oh, well, good, good. I'm glad to know that someone, someone, because I did look at the list and I was like, oh, none of our local folks are on. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll send emails to someone else. Always send. Yeah, we, we, don't, we, don't have to be on, we don't have to be on the committee to be able to help you. Okay. Or to look into it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does anyone have any last minute ideas they'd like to speak about? Sir, you mentioned that about the homestead. Um, where are you with that? Well, um, since it affects so many consumers in, in saving their homes, I'm uh, actually, I guess I categorize myself as a, uh, a, Bernie, uh, a Bernie Sanders uh, follower, and therefore I uh, am firmly on the side of the average person. Um, I'm not on the side of uh, the creditors in the least, even though there are good creditors, just like there are good consumers and bad consumers, but overall I, I am four square seeing the necessity for this law that's designed uh, to keep people in their homes. And it's uh, for the whole state. Uh, this one law is um, of such major importance that I came here tonight to see what's happening. And I wanted to ask, I'm glad you asked, I wanted to ask Christine, if I understood her correctly, that if the leadership of the uh, uh, assembly was to say that we should enact a, a clarification that the law will not be retroactive, that she would support that. Did I understand that correctly? No, no. Um, I think based on the Friday court decision, making the law not retroactive would be harmful. So, sorry, making... Say that again, please. I'm so, sorry. Friday's court decision said that the law is retroactive. Yes. So, I think any amendment on the bill should not... Any bill that says that the law is not retroactive would be harmful to that court decision and be harmful to consumers based on the change of law on Friday. So I would not support the bill 
um, that came out of committee, which just clarified the dates. So if a bill comes out, and again, right now it's in the speaker's hands, uh, if, if they wish to make it clarify that it's retroactive, that's great. I'd vote yes on it. If they decide to let the courts decide, I, I wouldn't, you know, that could be the determination of the Speaker of the House. Yes. I think um, the decision of uh, Judge uh, Tancredi is so strong and so well presented that uh, I know the opponents of that decision are uh, thinking of a, a very unusual strategy, and it might be not appealing it, but we'll see. But it is uh, of critical importance financially to um, anyone that owns a, a home in this state. It, is, it goes to their financial essence. And, uh, and yes, it's, uh, it's sometimes interesting that one little law, like one little piece of medicine or one piece of DNA, might be so critical to the entire political body, uh, which brings me out here tonight to ask about that clarification. And um, I'm glad to hear that uh, yourself and others then would, uh, you know, support it because it's been long, long overdue, and it's not such a radical departure that other states right around us have already have had this for quite a long time. It's just that Connecticut hasn't updated to get with the times. And uh, are you talking about tolls? <laughs> Are you talking about tolls? Cold? Tolls. Tolls. I'm making a joke. I'm making a joke. I mean, I, my argument is we're the only we're the only state on the eastern half of the country, other than Kentucky. So we are Kentucky brethren, and us are the two states that do not have tolls. Oh, I see. I just, I just, oh, yeah. I'm, I see. The way you said it, we're surrounded by states that have this, that have it. Yeah. Uh, yeah everyone's afraid of, of affecting grocery. Prices because if they go through the trucks, yes. As long as they drive in big circles around us and then come to us, we pay everyone else's tolls <laughs> right. for our food. The, the, yeah. No, but these. I didn't mean that. Yeah. So raising the Homestead Act to seventy-five thousand and two fifty was a huge deal from our state. We, me, and many who put the bill in, my team who helped <clears> me, wanted to raise it higher, and it was negotiation to get to the two fifty, which is way better than seventy-five. Oh yeah. Not the end of the road. Um, and I think the judge, the bankruptcy judge, made a really good opinion. And I'm glad he yeah. released we have, it while we we're still in session. We have to plug this one too. Two seventy eight is the one that's going to be covering CPTV, SECTV. Uh, so right now, folks are cutting their cable. Uh, I actually thought about it too. It's almost like three hundred something dollars. You know what? I'm I'm a simpleton. I want to just turn the TV on and go up and down and be able to watch what I want. I don't understand the streaming part that well. I guess I'm getting old. Uh, but the way this is funded, public television, is through cable. Uh, and now that cable is getting the cord cut by many young folks and folks that understand technology, uh, there's no way to support this venue. Uh, if you watch SEC TV, I actually, I got to do a, you know, I, I have a show on it, so that's not why I'm trying to save it, because it's a new recent show. Uh, but it's actually opened my eyes even more to the, the quality of a, of a spot that you can go and do a show and broadcast out to the public. Uh, it's a great service and uh, it's a bill I'm going to support and uh, just be on the lookout for it because things are changing. Like every, you know, a lot the argument against it is, well, people can make videos with their cell phones and, and, and post it out and there's an argument for that, but it, it's not at the level of what's happening down at SEC TV and all these great little spots around the world and around or around our country, I should say. And yeah, our volunteer who came here, so others who couldn't be here today can right. watch it on Thank SCD. you. Thank yes. you very yeah. much. Yes. Hopefully Thank you'll be able to watch us on, on, the, on, the, on the show. On the local public access. Yeah. We know not everyone can make it today. Some people, um, mm -hmm. you know, might be homesick or worried about the increase in COVID rates. So this way they'll be able to catch on later. And if folks, your issue wasn't addressed, please reach out, email, call. Um, and we'd love to hear from you.